So you want accountability, but what truly is accountability and how do we quantify somebody is accountable? Hey, ladies and gentlemen, we're here to talk about economics, politics, foreign policy, veterans issues, reform the criminal justice system and drug laws. This channel probably will offend you, but most importantly, this is where socialism comes to die. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, we're back and we're going to have a little discussion about the comments and videos made by Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Schiller of the United States Marine Corps in terms of him demanding accountability and his resignation. And I'm kind of going to touch on both videos, but I'm also going to shift into what exactly is accountability after the war in Afghanistan. And I use a lot of examples from the war in Vietnam because they were both counterinsurgencies. They're both very similar. And there were both a lot of the same mistakes made. But what is true accountability as we go into this? Before I go any farther, please like, subscribe. Let me know in the comments what you think. Please share with your friends. And if you disagree with what I have to say, because I guarantee you this video will be the one that a lot of veterans will disagree with my opinion on, I think, based on the comments I got back on social media. Let me know in the comments why you disagree. And if you want to have a civil debate about what you think compared to what I say, then let me know. I'll have you on the show. I'll send you the link and we'll do a live debate to talk about it. And then after the live debate's over, I'll go ahead and publish it to my page so it stays there so everybody can see it and offer their opinions and who they agree with. Right now, it's a very contentious subject. As we end the war in Afghanistan, I can say that as both a career soldier and as a veteran of Afghanistan and Iraq. And I'm going to do my utmost in this video to be unbiased and to try to go from an academic standpoint. Because the one thing when people talk about accountability, the one thing that will start coming out after this war, more so than any other war based on the availability of further education, is not just senior officers with masters and PhDs, but senior NCOs who obtain a master's degree and decide to produce pursue their PhD as I have. And there's going to be dissertations written on the failings in Afghanistan and the failings in Iraq, or in my case, the failings of our country and our military and our politicians to understand exactly how complicated a counterinsurgency is to fight. Now, Lieutenant Colonel Schiller, and I saw his first video it built up a lot of respect because it does take some guts to put yourself out there in uniform when in the military, you can support political parties. You can attend political rallies. You cannot do it in uniform. You cannot represent your service while you do it. By him doing his first video in uniform from what apparently looked like his office, he violated this. So when people raise hell about him being fired, my personal opinion is, yes, everybody is allowed freedom of speech under the First Amendment. What they are not allowed is freedom from consequence. So I do not disagree with his command relieving him, as he didn't in his second video or in some of his writings. He understood why they relieved him. And I can respect him for bringing that up. It takes a lot to take a 17-year career and know that the second you publish this video, that there's a good chance you're gonna bring it into it. So I truly do understand the sacrifice he felt he was making at that moment and what he was willing to give up at that moment. I, I do understand. And in 23 years, to be honest, I wasn't, I'm not against doing something like that. There was just never a point in my career where I felt a need to do that to end my career. What I will say is, there was a big thing in airborne units where if you felt you were right or you were standing up for one of your paratroopers, then it's time to stand in the door. And in his mind, I truly believe that's what he did at that moment when he shot that video. And I can respect that. Going into his second video and just in the description, I will have links to both his videos, his first and his second. After watching his second video and reading some of the things he's written since that first video, it really makes me wonder about ulterior motives because he talks about his entrepreneurship. He hints at other ways to make money. He doesn't outright ask for 
donations. In fact, he says he doesn't want them, but you could send them to his wife. What if they were a happily married couple? Why would the donations go to his wife, not help pay the bills in that household? So I, I really want to believe he did this as an altruistic act, but I also find it very hard to believe that he is altruistic in his actions. And I say that from the first video was pretty good. The second video, what I really saw in a lot of ways was the same tone, the same word usage, just the same, the air of I'm the smartest guy in the room and that's why I'm out maneuvering the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And I find it hard to deal with this because I saw that when I worked in the state capitol in Missouri. I saw politicians and professional public servants who become assistant directors and directors of state agencies that had that attitude. And by them holding that attitude, they were better than you because they knew better. I would also like to say with sending out a message messages on social media, asking for feedback from veterans and active duty personnel. And I promise them it would be their names would not come up and they will not. And in a few cases, I sent direct messages to senior leaders who are either retired or still on active duty to ask their opinion on him. The consensus I got back from most veterans and a lot of people was after watching the first video, he's standing up and he's doing the right thing by his Marines. I won't argue that either after the first time you watch the first video. Now, I also know talking to a few of them after they saw the second video or some of the other writings that he's published since then, they like me question his motives. He had 17 years to, and I quote him, to throw your rank down on the table and stand up for what you think is right. And he chose now to do it. When Afghanistan's in the spotlight, when his video can go viral. I do not want to condemn him as a person. What I will say is let time be the truth teller of this. A year from now, two years from now, when he monopolizes this in a business, a book, or a run for political office, then what I really feel down in my heart about him will come true. I hope it's not. So a year from now, two years from now, if I pr if time proves me wrong, please come back and beat me up about it. Because that's what I'd really like to hope for. Another comment he made that really bothered me was a Thomas Jefferson quote. And I like Jefferson, I do. If you watch my videos, I often quote the Founding Fathers. And the quote he made was, every generation needs a revolution. So is he trying to inspire a military coup or a new revolution? Because the term revolution is very obtuse, to probably put it best. It can be through the polls or it can be through violence. Historically speaking, most revolutions have been through violence. I swore an oath as he did when I enlisted and as he commissioned. Mine was to protect the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and to obey the orders of those appointed over me. And I still hold true to that. Because I do think, as a United States citizen, your ultimate duty is to our country and to the Constitution. So the idea of a revolution is abhorrent to me, unless he can explain to me exactly what he means. And for the record, the only social media, because he, he brings up his only social media is Facebook and LinkedIn. I am not currently on Facebook for a lot of reasons. On LinkedIn, I did reach out to him and ask him for any comments he had before I did this video. I've given him a week and I've gotten no reply from him. So I went ahead and did this video based on the feedback I had and my own thoughts. Now, where he goes, I do not know. But I do think up, it brings up a bigger question of what is accountability? Because basically what he's calling for, if you listen to his videos, is a resignation of service chiefs and Secretary Austin. And 
senior leaders across the military. Well, here's what I will say to him. Secretary Austin, General Milley, the current service chiefs of the Army, Air Force, Marines, Navy, and Space Force. And I'll bring up kind of a funny point that didn't occur to me until I sat down to do this video. They weren't there. They weren't in those positions when the war in Afghanistan started. In 2001, we conducted operations into 2002. In early 2002, at the end of Operation Anaconda, President George Bush said, now we need to begin reconstruction. Now, with that being said, if we're not nation building, then how are we conducting reconstruction in a place where construction never truly happened? And if you really want to understand the history of what I'm saying in Afghanistan, go back to the 1925, 26 time frame, up through the 50s with the monarchy, from there through the, commun the civil war and communist takeover, through the civil war to our invasion. If you have not done that, then you're not truly a student of Afghanistan. If you do not know the history all the way back to the attempted conquest by Alexander when it was Bactria and his marriage to Roxana and why that happened, then you really don't have a leg to stand on when you talk about where we succeeded or failed in Afghanistan or who should be held accountable. Accountability. What is accountability? Is it fine? Secretary of Defense resigns, the service chiefs resign. Or they don't resign, they retire because they have enough time and they're retired. Is that accountability? Do we recall the active duty, every service chief, vice service chief in place since 2001? Do we attempt to recall all our secretaries of defense and hold them accountable? And how are they held accountable? You can't send them to jail. A resignation is not accountability. A resignation or a retirement is I'm retiring. What is true accountability? Well, let's bring the politicians into account because they supported this war. Well, that's never going to happen and we all know it. And we can hold congressional hearings and congressional fact-finding about what happened. But in the end, in the last 10 years in our country, that becomes a political game of hot potato. And the example I'll give you is when the Pentagon Papers were leaked, and I believe it was 2018 or 19, and we had a Democrat as the president. They condemned the person that leaked them. Well, let's go back in time to Vietnam. When the papers were leaked about Vietnam, the Democrats applauded that effort. But when there was a Democratic president and Democrats supported this war, they condemned and said the person that leaks these papers should go to prison. So there's a... There's a polarization when it comes to politics in our country that are really going to stop any true accountability from happening from the standpoint of Congress. The war in Afghanistan, which, as I said, I've got a personal stake in accountability in the review and what happened there, because I did spend a lot of time there. In fact, I can tell you about Kandahar when we lived in tents. I can tell you about Bagram intense. I can tell you about a time before the bar, boardwalk in Kandahar. I can tell you about a time before all these fast food places in Bagram. I can talk about when Gardez was still known as the Alamo. I can talk about the first Romanian patrol from Kandahar to Kabul because I was on it to try to open up the highway. So, yes, I do have a very personal stake in this. And unlike the majority of our politicians in Congress, now, with the exception, Tom Cotton, Dan Crenshaw, and a few others, they did, they served their country and did their time. Dan Crenshaw, Tammy Duckworth, as far as I know, were medically retired. Tom Cotton decided to pursue public service as an elected official. So I'm not knocking them for that. What I'm saying is a few of them do understand what was at stake and the sacrifices that were made. But the majority of them do not. And it's going to become a game of political football many times by those who did not serve. Because of that, there will be very little that comes out of that. Many of the lessons learned by the military, because they're not actually 
in the military, you use lessons learned. What was your mission? What happened? What went well? What went bad? What can we do to make it better next time? You know, the standard after action review format, which is not really a bad format, but coming out of a war like this, it's very dangerous because if it becomes politicized, if it becomes one-sided, if it becomes looked at by politicians who are not students of history, they're not truly students of political science or international relations. They do not truly understand economics. That's shown by a whole bunch of the bills are publishing right now. But if you talk to them and say, well, what about the Philippines and in Nicaragua and in the Philippines again? Well, let's go back farther. Let's talk about the American Civil War or the American Revolution when we were the insurgents or the Indian Wars. And no, I'm not trying to be politically incorrect. That's what they're known as, which led us into the Philippines, which led us into Nicaragua, which led us into World War II in the Philippines, where American service members were part of the insurgency against the Japanese. And here's a secret. If you don't know the outcome of World War II, they didn't get defeated in the Philippines. And it led us to Vietnam the British had Malaysia and Yemen and Aden. Counterinsurgency, counterinsurgency warfare is not something new, but it's something we've never been really good at. So maybe the whole point of the accountability is people stand up and say, yes, we knew going in we could not succeed. But nobody's going to do that. Military leaders will resign. They will retire. But politicians will never admit they were wrong. Because some of the same politicians condemning what happened in Afghanistan were the ones that, that were wholeheartedly for it. They were wholeheartedly for the change in policy along the way. The newsletter that had to be sent, com, sent to CENTCOM Weekly with photographs. We'll go back to the Alice's Restaurant. Eight by 10 color glossy photos of both combat operations and reconstruction such as chicken farms where you had a count of how many chickens were still alive. That's the war we came to fight in the end. Now, we talk about holding people accountable. So General Milley resigns or retires. Secretary Austin resigns. What does that really accomplish? Because my personal feeling is if you go by the other commissioning and regulations that cover military officers, some of the comments that General Milley made at the end of the Trump's presidency says that General Milley should have resigned. Derogatory comments about the president and the administration. Well, when General McChrystal's staff made those made derogatory comments about the Obama administration, his staff made comments, and it was published in Rolling Stone, General McChrystal was forced to retire. Although General Milley gets hailed by the left as somebody who's willing to stand by the Constitution when he did the exact same thing. So if we want to talk about accountability, be very careful when we do that from the standpoint of the political field that our country lays in now. Or how about we do this? How about that we do a good accounting about what went well, what went wrong? How about we admit we're just not really good at counterinsurgency and should avoid it at all costs, no matter what? Because in the end, that's the true answer. And, and I say that as somebody who, in the beginning, truly believed in our mission in Afghanistan. And, and the example I'll give you is, when I first got to Afghanistan, we were dealing with militias and warlords. Then we had governors and still some militias and then, then we developed the Kandak battalions, then the Afghan National Army. And there was a picture I was looking for of the 1st Brigade 82nd. A lot of the NCOs went over to a a Hill with the Afghan division that was there. And we worked with the NCOs in that division. And it's a picture of all of us together. It's a pretty cool picture. I wish I could find it. And I remember that day. I remember that day well. I remember talking to my counterpart, which is the Brigade Operations Sergeant Major, and he had been trained by the Russians. 
and then Pakistani ISI, then mentored by members of the CIA. What was I going to teach this guy about warfare or developing operations? I'm some barely over 30 year old E7 in the army. But I enjoyed talking to him. I enjoyed eating with him. And we had chai. And we talked about stuff that was going on. Or I can talk about the trip to a girl's school in Afghanistan. Now, this is an environment where girls had not been allowed to go to school at all. They were there to get married and have children and keep a house. And that was it. And I walk into this Afghan girl school and there's little girls sitting there the same age as my oldest daughter. So yes, I did have a very personal stake in what we're doing there. And I did truly believe in a lot of it. So for me, this is a very tough time and it's a very, yes, I demand accountability too. But the idea of burning down the system, A, is going to end in failure and B, we don't burn down the system. We use the system to make changes in itself. One of the people I reached out to before I did this video, and I'm going to try as hard as possible to describe his career without identifying him. Because I met him as a young first lieutenant, which means I think at that point he had been in the Army for about two to three years. And... He had gotten yanked up to brigade staff because he was really good at what he did on battalion staff. Yes, I feel sorry for you to this day. But you were good at it even when I picked on you. And our then Brigade S3 came out. I was the only NCO, not commissioned officer, enlisted person in the office at that time. And he was talking to pre-command captains and this young lieutenant. And they had been venting some of their frustrations about a career in the military. And what he told them was, don't make a decision about whether or not to stay in the army until you've already done your company command. Make your decision at that point. And, and what I know to be true based on staying in touch with some of them and serving with them over the years, A, he became a general. And B, every single one of those officers stayed on after their company command. They became operations officers and XOs. They became battalion commanders and brigade commanders and regimental commanders. So this call by Lieutenant Colonel Schiller for accountability, I understand. But I also know that there's a lot of men and women I saw as lieutenants and captains and as privates and specialists and sergeants and staff sergeants that are now colonels on the verge of becoming generals. One of them for sure I know will wear stars. He will, I could see him as the chief of staff of the army at some point. They will hold each other accountable. They will account for those mistakes, for their mistakes as they coach, teach and mentor the next generation of leaders coming up in the army. And I, I will go ahead and speak for the other services because I don't know for sure because I was not in them or as much involved with them. But I guarantee you the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Air Force and even Space Force will do the same. The lessons learned from this war will not be forgotten. They may be by the American people. They may be by our politicians. The military itself will hold each other accountable. Maybe not in the way you think they should, but in ways that are very important. I guess the takeaways from this video are, yes, we do need accountability. But maybe ultimately that accountability is avoid getting into a ground war when we don't have to. Use your special operations forces in targeted strikes. Let them do what they want to do, what they're trained to do, what they volunteered to do. Originally, the mission, the mission in Afghanistan was to destroy Al-Qaeda and ensure they could not have sufficient places to train in Afghanistan. 
which also incurred toppling the Taliban government at the time. By early 2002, that had been accomplished. But for a terrorist organization such as Al-Qaeda or Al-Shabaab or ISIS, or I can list them all day long, to have a place to train, all they need is failed or the theocracies. Failed states or theocracies. So if they can't train in Afghanistan, they have the Sudan. If they can't use the Sudan, they have Somalia. So the idea we are going to stop them by invading and trying to create a nation where there never has been a nation. And, and seriously, if you don't talk about Afghanistan, research Afghanistan all the way back to the time of Alexander. And you will understand that this was a failed concept. The whole process that we started on was a fallacy. You cannot nation build where there's never been a nation. You can give them things. You can help them build things. But you cannot create a nation if they don't feel they are a nation. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like what I have to say, please like, subscribe. Let me know in the comments what you think. If you dislike what I have to say, tell me why you dislike it in the comments. And if you want to come on and do a live debate, we can do that. But it will be civil. And we will try to do something constructive. Share this with your friends, even if you disagree with it, and let them give their opinions to what I have to say. Remember, never stop questioning our government because that's our right as citizens. That's what differentiates us between Cuba and China and these other countries. We have social media to question our government. Use that power. All right, everybody have a good evening.